I tell you, nothing like moving to a new place, doing some heavy lifting, stretching the muscles. Isn't it great, guys? We. Oui. I don't know why I didn't think of this before. I mean, why keep filming all my stuff at home when I have a perfectly good location just waiting to be used? Were we always filming at your house? Yeah, to be honest, it was actually really inconsistent where we were. What's important is that we have this fantastic location built on top of a harmless Indian burial ground that rests below the hulking remains of a burnt down insane asylum for schizophrenic homicidal orphans. And vampire puppies. So, why don't you guys get busy putting together those very heavy props while I figure out where to put this delightful Halloween ornament? <laughs> Oh, and if you guys could place them in the order of my favorite props to my least favorite props, that'd be great. Bye! You're lost! You don't get to take notes with me as I watch the highlight of any nostalgia ween, the Stephen King miniseries. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yep. Nothing like celebrating the holidays by attacking a man who's done absolutely nothing to me and is making his living by entertaining others. Oh, we'll show him, won't we, Pennywise? Oh, yeah. We all know he's had some classic stories, but he's also had some classic blunders. And nowhere are they more spotlighted than in the overly long and overly goofy miniseries. Only this time, the idea is not to get one of his ideas to the screen, it's rectifying a version that he's hated for years. That, of course, being The Shining. Most are aware of the Stanley Kubrick adaptation, or as the Brits like to say, Kubrick. And for the most part, audiences seem to enjoy it. That is, of course, except for King. Yup, the guy who loved 2012 and Death Race couldn't stand the theatrical release of The Shining. So, what to do? Release his own version on TV in 1997 with a teleplay entirely written by him. It's sure to have some kingly awkwardness, and I'm here to take notes on it for my next review. So. What are we waiting for? Let's dive into the Wish You Overlooked Hotel with The Shining. So our story takes place not in Maine. What the hell is going on here? As we open with Jack, played now by Steven Weber, being instructed how to handle the boiler room when he becomes the caretaker of the Overlook Hotel. Oh, and I don't mean briefed. I mean instructed with every single detail. This is your pressure gauge. It's got a safety valve. Hey, this is your drop valve. So here's what you gotta do. This son of a buck has been rusted shut. No safety valve. You rated for 160 every night. Last thing. You know, oddly enough, King, the inner workings of a water boiler described by Commissioner Gordon in the hopes that your obvious setup for the climax will seem less silly isn't as riveting as you think. Well, yeah. But at least he has some history to welcomingly scare the shit out of the new housekeeper. We had this lady here last summer, Slitteris. Then there was this last caretaker, Grady. What about him? Shotgun. Both barrels. Oh. Jeez, I hope you don't say this on all the hotel tours. And over there is the kitchen where old Mary McCreed cooked her husband. Ah! Pipe down, he was delicious. Jack then talks to the owner of the hotel, played by the shaking head of Elliot Gould. The board has decided to put an alcoholic less than a year away from his last drink in charge of one of the greatest resort hotels in America. May I be frank? Oh, why stop now? It makes me sick. Here are the keys. Enjoy your stay. I'll not only be taking care of the Overlook, but I'll be taking care of myself and my family. While Jack assures our mystery theater actor that he's no longer on the sauce, we see his boy and wife waiting eagerly at home, played by Kirtland Mead and Rebecca De Mornay. Did your dad get the job? Uh-huh. He and the man he talked to didn't like each other, but he got it. Are you sure? Uh-huh. Yay! That's right. In this version, the parents are totally aware that the kid is psychic, and the reaction is... I guess when you get down to it, that is kind of a legit reaction. I mean, what's he have to look forward to? An apartment with a neon sign on top of the Walgreens? Pilot the tower, pilot the tower, gotta make emergency landing. This makes Jack's wife, Wendy, think back, quite randomly the more I think about it, to that terrible night when her husband had been drinking too much. Or at least, badly imitating a guy who's been drinking too much. Look at this man! Go off to use the phone and this is what I come back to? Answer me, you damn pup! I'll fix you! Slurred cliches and monotone anger. The only thing to make this more obvious is an empty bottle of- There we go. What did you do to Danny? I am never going to another emergency ward, Jack. Said you could stop on your own. I was wrong. Anything ever happens again, I am packing my bags and I'm leaving. You're right. It's gotta end. 
One way or the other. As you can see, I'm really torn up about it. But his son Danny is having his own issues outside, as his imaginary friend Tony tries to communicate with him. Danny. Danny. Hi, Doc. <laughs> really? So, Tony all this time was an awkwardly hovering version of the Encyclopedia Britannica kid? I don't think anyone could have predicted that from the Kubrick version. I always thought it was a demonic rendition of the Frosted Flakes mascot. What do you want? But Tony shows him some scary images of what's to come, like a killer hose. <sighs> Wait, what? <sighs> you know, King, you have a talent for taking things that are very obviously not scary and keeping them very obviously not scary. I mean, what are you going to do? Try to make croquet scary too? Oh, for God's sake, just because you put blood or teeth on something doesn't mean we're automatically going to be frightened by it. I mean, can you think of an instance where you just took something random, you put blood or teeth on, and that instantly worked? Ah, that was different! It turns out the horrifying croquet mallet was just another one of Danny's visions. Though Jack does seem to be struggling as he finds himself calling his AA sponsor, who loves reminding him of stuff that he apparently already knows. Well, you know what they say at the AA meetings, don't you? You know what they say in the meetings, Jack. Well, if he knows, why are you telling him? But it's still tempting for him as he finds himself drawn to local pubs like the Tavern Tavern. Here's to hoping randomly toasting people outside my window doesn't lead to ironic consequences. <laughs> I'm benign. So they make their way to the hotel as they play their favorite driving game, What the Hell Did My Son Just Say? Elmer Martin at daycare. It was a daughter dinner. Am I the only one you ever met? It overlooked just the summertime hotel. Of course it doesn't help that his teeth look like someone photoshopped Napoleon Dynamite's mouth onto it. <laughs> Well, he does! Funny-looking children have just as much a right to be made fun of as any other person. Hey, where'd you get that? They approach the hotel, and everything for the most part seems pretty welcoming. Here they come across Dick Halloran. Nice to know you, Mr. Halloran. Dick, please. Well, Doc, you gonna give me a hand, or you just gonna stand there? So Dick, of course, explains that Danny and him share the same psychic power that he refers to as The Shining. And that if he ever needs help, just to use his power to contact him. And maybe a half a dozen times, I've seen things. What were they, Dick? Now, I, of course, am too sophisticated to make any jokes about a tiny little boy talking to a big black dick. But for the record, I'd like to show you how many opportunities I had to make a joke. Give me a blast. You're gonna come down to St. Pete with me. Nobody's gonna tell your daddy anything. Just look the other way and count to ten. I bet you just about glow in the damn dark. Just promise me you won't go in. This is between you and me. What do you want me to think? Anything as long as it's hard. I should get a medal for how many I'm avoiding. Oh, by the way, be scared. A door closed. Ah! But that's not the important part. The real juicy stuff is we have a hotel to tour. So there's a pantry back there, there's a vegetable bin here. And tour. Dining room seats, 200, used to seat almost twice that many. And tour. The elevator's the easiest way to the service area. And tour. That would be in one of the smaller freezers, you get to that through the pantry. And tour. The master bedroom, madame. And oh my god, are you gonna show us every goddamn fucking room? How about some scary stuff? I mean, aside from, by the way, the door closed. Ah! and the scariest thing we've come across is a hose and the Encyclopedia Britannica guy. Tell me you're trying harder than this. Gotta get moving. Oh, thank God. Hey, you wanna see more of this place? No! Jesus Christ, the boom mic in the reflection is more exciting to watch than this. I'm at least trying to make excuses about how it's a ghost mic or something. Hey, it's about as scary as a hose or the Encyclopedia Britannica, kid. Can't you give us something? Than that! But finally, the guy gets going and they start looking after the place. Oh, and he's already off to a bang off start, as he accidentally comes across a wasp nest and gets stung. Can I keep it in my room, Mom? Do you think that's. It's fine. It's fine. They're all dead, guaranteed. Hey, come on. I thought the only wasp we needed were the three right in front of us. Oh, well, they're looking over a big, creepy, scary hotel. You know, those will lead to a lot of other scary possibilities. Like bringing groceries into the hotel, putting them away, reading a children's book, putting that away, discussing the children's book immediately after they read it, really? 
You are doing so fantastic. Well, finally, we do get some form of suspense when Danny locks himself in the bathroom. Oh no, another Miracle Whip binge. Wake up now! Tony was here, he was here. There is no Tony. There's no imaginary pal who comes and shows you the future. Now will you stop with that crap? So, what are they gonna do after this bit of excitement? Talk about it, of course. I just got scared because um, I thought, you know what? I don't know what I thought. Oh Jesus, do something! I mean, how far along are we again? Do something! Okay, great. So they finally decide that Danny should go to a doctor. Fair enough. But what kind of doctor should he go to? This one in Sidewinder that's supposed to be good. It's not a pediatrician, he's a GP, but... Oh my God, are you serious? A file tax is more exciting than this! You know what scares me? The idea that nothing scary will ever happen? Your anger. Oh, yeah, Lord knows. That's much more scary than the insane ghost downstairs constantly messing with your hotel. Yeah, literally, all sorts of weird stuff is going on downstairs, and where are our caretakers? Finding out how many different ways they can say sorry. Sorry. How many ways can I say it? Oh, I don't know. I'm sure you'll film everyone that comes to mind, though. I mean, seriously, are the ghosts just patiently waiting for them to notice what they're doing? Wendy. I don't want this to be an angry place, Jack. Uh, guys, you know we're doing a lot of creepy stuff down here. Sorry. Turn the lights on and off, the jukebox, moving things. Pretty scary. You know? Okay, uh, well, whenever you guys get a minute, uh, feel free to come on down and take a look at it and, uh, maybe be terrified. If not, um, just have a good night, enjoy your conversation, and, uh... Yeah, good luck with your little problem there. You too. Again, scary. Very scary. Boom. We do at last get a little bit more action as the wasp nest suddenly comes alive again. God, it's like those replenishing bees from the Mega Man games. They just never die. Bees, my god. But whoa, that was way too much excitement for part one. So let's level it out with the incredibly exciting actions of going to the kitchen, getting a container, trapping them in it, taking them outside, going into the living room, retrieving your camera, taking pictures of the wounds, and talking about how you can use this to possibly get some insurance money from it. Yeah, I think $5,000 a sting should do it, huh? don't you think? Okay! We're an hour and a half in! The other movie had an elevator, a blood, two scary girls, and... Whatever the fuck that was! And aside from the ghost once again closing the doors every once in a while, nothing creepy is happening at all! What's next? They're gonna terrifyingly tinker with the thermostat? So as we begin part two, which I'm sure a lot of people saw, seeing how part one was so riveting, we finally see Danny goes to the doctor. How did Danny break his arm? His father did. Jack didn't mean to hurt him, but he was drunk. Didn't we go over this? The flashback, remember? Drunken Christian Bale hurting his son? We saw this. Why does this need to be repeated? So your family's mending? I think it is, Doctor. We're trying to move on. This moment of pointlessly long writing brought to you by Stephen King, helping young kids reach the top shelf for 40 years. God, even when a setup for a scary moment happens, look what they do with it. Danny, join us. Danny. Shut up! Do you hear me? Just shut up! Danny! It's snowing! Take a look. It's snowing! Hey, thank God! Satan and his demon army can be dealt with later. It's snowing! Whee! <laughs> God, I can't take this shit! Yes. Hey, Critic. Uh, we felt really bad about abandoning you while you were moving everything. <laughs> yeah, you did. Ah. We were wondering if you wanted us to come back and help you out. Rachel, <clears throat> let me explain something to you. Whenever you call and interrupt me, you're breaking my concentration. You're distracting me, and it'll take time to get back to where I was. You understand? What got into you? Aunt Flo in town? <sighs> We're gonna make a new rule. 
whenever you hear me typing like this. How can I hear you typing if you're miles away? Or whether you don't hear me typing, whatever the fuck you hear me doing, when I am in here, I am working, and that means you don't call. Now you think you can handle that? I'd like to say you used to be so nice, but that wouldn't be correct. Why don't you start by getting the fuck out of here? Because I'm not in the same room with you. Bay that! Good, no moving day. Let's go celebrate with some pumpkin tacos. The Shining. What? The Shining, the movie. Where Jack Nicholson goes crazy? You'll have to be a little more specific. The Kubrick movie. I think he's gone crazy and it's reenacting the Kubrick movie. We have to do something before he goes too far. Oh, hell no, I'm not doing that. Why? Do you know what happens to the black guy in that movie? No. What happens to all black guys in scary movies? No. Well, let's just say it doesn't end well. Well, let's just say if something happens to the critic, then we're out of a job. But I wanted to try the pumpkin burger from McDonald's. Drive! Fine. But if they run out of pumpkin McNuggets, I'm blaming you. So I know you're all blown away with that snow scene, but sad to say, some actual suspense seems to enter the picture. When Danny is tempted to go into room 217, which he has been forbidden to go in. Doc. What are you doing here, Doc? They're like pictures in a book. Doc, if you give them the chance to become more than I that, can they can- I go in here if I want to. Go away. Leave me alone. Uh, good. To find out how you can own the new Encyclopedia Britannica- Cody, where are you? Help me! I was talking to the people at home. Just a whole stupid. Ah! Just call this number and we'll send you this free booklet. Danny. What are you doing? Nothing, Daddy. Nothing, Daddy. What are you doing in Mr. Ullman's office? Oddly enough, most of the transition of Jack turning crazy is done surprisingly pretty flowingly. That is except for this one moment where I think a page was out of place or something because suddenly he's in full nut mode with no lead in at all. What have you got behind your back? Nothing, Daddy. Nothing, honey. Not supposed to go into any of the guest rooms. What should we do about a little boy who cannot keep to the rules? Daddy, I didn't go in the- Men follow the rules. They also say their ass very difficultly. Oh, and just when you thought this movie couldn't get any more drawn out, any more boring, any more tediously long-winded, we get a 12-minute conversation about their marriage without any scares, any action, or any suspense whatsoever. What has happened to us, Jack? Please, please try to bear with me. I hate this place now. I'm just interested in the papers I found down the cellar. Is stress the reason you don't want to make love to me anymore? Entertain! Entertain! I mean, we didn't have much back in Boulder, but pretty happy. I know how much I bitch things up for myself. I'm not talking about the guest room. You won't be sorry. I do. The booze and my temper and George Hatfield. And... Your husband lost his last chance because his son sees things sometimes? That is so unfair, and you know it. The situation is unfair. D -ra. So after that terrifying bit of horror, we finally get to where the real scary shit lies in all this. The real terrifying heart that it's all been building up to. The plants don't have snow on them anymore. <laughs> Oh, and you know what's even scarier? Having them be totally still while playing animal sound effects over them. <laughs> Jesus Christ, I'm gonna piss myself. <laughs> Ooh, I'm gonna write a Doctor Who episode about this. <laughs> And because breaking in the first time went so well, Dandy decides maybe doing it again will turn out even better consequences. 
And, wouldn't you know it, something actually a touch scary does occur here. Josh Holloway? So that's where you went after Lost. Hello, Danny. Knock, knock. Who's there? Zoom, motherfucker! When the parents come across him, they notice he's not his usual cryptic self, but rather a more unusual cryptic self. Danny? Hey, Danny, way to get to first base! You bastard! Hey, I, I never... Danny, I... If you so much as lay a finger on him again, I will wait till you're asleep and I will kill you. Of course she figures out it wasn't Jack and asks him to go figure out who did it. After five minutes of talking about it, of course! You have to get out of here. What are you talking about? The place was bad. Everything bad that happened here is still here. Stop talking about it and just show us what's fucking scary! But if we don't go soon, we might not be able to go at all. Oh look! A commercial! I do hope they're still talking when they come back from it! The first bad thing And they are! Know. What the hell?! Are you fucking serious?! The conversation was so long that it literally needed a commercial break?! Look, in books, I know stories are carried through a lot of dialogue and obviously a lot of words, that's the medium, but film is a visual medium! Show, don't tell! I mean, by God, imagine if George Malaise, instead of showing his voyage to the moon, just talked about it the whole time! So they got in this very flat, strange-looking device that kind of looked like a penis and launched it into the moon. Oh, the moon, by the way, has a face on it, and it actually hits the face in the eye. Oh, this would be rather unbelievable if we were to see this visually, but... Nah! D-Rom! D-Rom! So Jack decides to go up there and carve himself a witch. Say, this looks like the most intimidating weapon around here. Oh, yeah, because you've already closed the door 186 times, maybe the 187th will catch us off guard! Alright, let's get some exciting, scary, and or run away like a pussy. Well, that's enough frightening stuff for this scene. Let's go back to more talking. Did you break the CB? It wasn't broken when you were in there? <laughs> Why would you hint at the scary thing we already saw? You showed it! You showed it in close-up! You showed it far away! You showed it at every angle imaginable! Okay, not every angle, you know, haha, <laughs> TV! But at the same time, we know what it looks like! We know what's scary about it! So why would keeping it in the shadows scare us when we know exactly what's in there? Why? I need a drink. God, I need a drink. Fuck my goddamn soul for just a shot of cupcake vodka. Why, hello there. Kinda dead tonight, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it is, Mr. Critic. What'll it be? Well, I'm so glad you asked me that. It turns out I have a lot of lost time to make up for. That's all on account of this miniseries. And I tell you, it keeps getting worse. Do tell, Mr. Critic. Do tell. For example, Jack pretends he doesn't see anything as tensions start to rise. I've got to dump the boiler! Look at your son! Can't you see the bruises on his neck? Are you blind? Stop it! I want to overact too! We'll talk about it later! So Jack goes and smashes the radio as well as the snow scooter and pretends like he doesn't know what's going on, resulting in a six minute conversation about how they're stuck. We could learn as we go, Jack! Maybe. We could listen to the weather, and we could pick a time when they're calling for three, four days without snow. Yeah! And if the forecast is wrong... Fuck the conversation, you can say this in four that. words! We're stuck! Oh, nut bunnies! Why is this so hard?! But things get suspenseful, I guess, when the hedge sculptures start to come to life. Wow, not since the happening have I been so not afraid of plant life. I'm so glad the CG artist from the Langoliers still got work. Things get even more hectic when one of the rooms locks Wendy inside. Why? 
I mean, what's the point when you really think about it? Even if they do catch up to him, what are they going to do? Give him poison ivy? Oh, hey, that wasn't us. You're just a clumsy clod. Daddy! And once again, what is this all building up to? Daddy! Hi, Mom! Absolutely nothing. You're, you're, you're jumping at shadows, babe. You know, some people like the first film version of The Shining, some don't. And I can understand either. But at the very least, you have to acknowledge it created a surreal, scary environment. And as soon as this version started, it was clear it was much more interested in talking about that scary world than it was actually showing it. And that was three goddamn hours ago! So... Oi, that sounds like a pain. You know, it's funny, Dominic. I didn't think this location had any alcohol, let alone a bar. It doesn't. You've just been hallucinating. In fact, you've been drinking toilet water for the past five minutes. Critic? Critic! Do you see him anywhere? Would you take that off? No, I'm not getting killed by a D-list internet celebrity. Look, there's his laptop. Maybe we can see what he's been working on. about the Shining. I don't know! I don't think that's true. I think you have some very definite ideas about what should be done about the Shining, and I would like to know what they are. I just think that you can find something good in it, and you'll feel better. You can find something good, you'll feel better. There is nothing good about it. No, there has to be something that King did better than Kubrick. Have you ever seen a miniseries without a single, solitary moment of entertainment in it? Stay back! You're letting your love of the old one get in the way! We're not even satirizing the new one anymore! We're satirizing the old one! That's because the new one sucks, and there is nothing to satirize! <laughs> there has to be something good! Give me the bat, Rachel. Stay away! Give me the bat. Stay back! Rachel! Give me the bat. <gasps> okay. Aha! <laughs> you just made your biggest mistake! <sighs> uh, hey. Open the door! Now you stay in there until you find something positive to say, mister. There is nothing positive in the miniseries! The original is so much better! Well, find something. Are we good? Yeah, no thanks to you. Oh, don't mention it. Hey, guys! <laughs> I forgot to mention, you're not going anywhere. <laughs> Go check out the car to see what I'm talking about. <laughs> Go check it out. <laughs> Go check it out. <laughs> Car's fine. Oh, really? Yeah, it looks like all he emptied was the windshield wiper fluid. Good luck driving without dirt debris all over your windows. <laughs> you know what this calls for? Pumpkin sauerkraut. Oh, I'm in. <laughs> well, see, while I'm here, we get another scene that seems to go nowhere. They see the elevator has been moving on its own, and Wendy climbs in and finds party masks and confetti. Ooh, is the elevator gonna drop or start moving so they have to pull her out in a suspenseful scene? Nope. It just stands there. 
By God, a scary scene was practically gift wrapped for you by the horror gods, and you didn't take advantage of it? That's like the Three Stooges looking at a pie lineup and saying, What are we supposed to do with these? Scare me, you fucking master of horror and suspense! Scare me! So Danny sees the ghosts are apparently dyslexic, and this finally convinces him to contact Dick. Oh yeah, a dead woman gnawing at your neck is okay, but bad grammar on the wall? Now that shit needs reinforcements. And just to pour more salt in the wound, he actually passes by an entertaining horror director, Sam Raimi, in a very bizarre cameo. I love you, Howie. You're one cheery MFA. MFA? Mighty fine America. No, please, follow him! Throw in a flying eye, a disembodied hand, a talking head! The scares in this movie are so fucking weak! I wouldn't be shocked if the next thing to scare us was a guy in a bad Halloween mask. Let me by. No way. No one gets past Rover. Three hours of build-up, guys, and this is what it's been amounting to. Was it worth it? But we do start getting some payoff with the ghost, at least, as they make themselves more and more visible to Jack. Oh my god, I have antlers! Oh, phew. That would have been as silly as a guy in a wolfman mask. But more ghosts start to become visible, including Mr. Grady, as they all start to liquor up Jack to make him more susceptible to their suggestions. Family killing suggestions, to be exact. Well, you might want to take that up with your son. He's crossed you at almost every turn. He must be corrected, sir. He and your wife both. We also see the scariest part of any Stephen King miniseries, Stephen King. Give him some credit, though, at least it looks like he's having fun in all this. But we have no time for conducting beerless Judge Ito's. We got some crazy Jack drinking Jack to exploit. As he tries attacking Wendy, but she fights him off by lightly tapping him with the breakable prop. <laughs> well, you know what this calls for, right? More goddamn talking! Sometimes he wasn't talking to himself. Skip it! Wendy and Danny drag him into the kitchen to lock him up. You know, son, we never do projects anymore. This is nice. But not only do the ghosts let him out, but they also start attacking the rest of the family with... Huh. Well, it's good to know Stephen King has moved on from balloons to the terrifying realms of confetti. Hey, watch out! Those look like real streamers! Stop it! We're gone! Stop it! <laughs> Uh, hello. Turn around. Kiss, Creepy guy kiss. here. Hey! That's what I've been missing. <sighs> <sighs> Croquet is still not scary! What is your deal? Now, by God, you are going to take your medicine. Or I'm now king of the nine witch at diamond formation! <laughs> Come on, I look silly enough carrying this thing. You don't need to make it funnier. But Wendy's done playing whack a de Mornay as she slams him in the face with a ball. And yet, somehow, quite miraculously, both these two seem to keep moving. Don't you think they'd be down for the count by this point? Mr. Torrance, Halloran's coming. You'd better take care of this, Mr. Torrance. Stay close, darling. I'll be back. See, I quote an Arnold movie instead of Carson to shake things up a bit. By the way, I hate lamps and TVs! Just thought I'd throw that out there. Congratulations, Dick! Jack? Dick, watch out! And here's your prize! No! <gasps> no, I don't think so. <sighs> you see what I'm talking about? It's not exactly inflicting spine-tingling terror when you do this with a croquet mallet instead of an axe. I get more Jim Carrey smashing that clock in the mask than I do something scary. Just add a cartoon sound effect to make it complete. Haha, <laughs> 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 still a classic. Yeah, things are about as laughably silly with Danny. Just look at how Tony tries to show him the boiler room is about to blow. <laughs> Daddy forgot to dump the boiler! But Danny does find out and manages to tell his father, who seems to be struggling back and forth between loving his son and turning into an evil Ed knockoff. What could a worthless little bub like you know? That my daddy hasn't dumped the boiler pressure today. No! Foiled by incompetent maintenance! 
Danny and Wendy manage to wake up Dick and they make their way out, resulting in Jack sacrificing himself by blowing up the house. Because, as we all know, explosions can apparently kill ghosts. Total protonic reversal. Goodbye, Daddy. Goodbye! And what's the only way we can wrap up 237 minutes of boredom? A goddamn graduation ceremony! Because we weren't bored enough! Great job, Dad! Dad! Oh, dear Rob. Dear Rob. Dear Rob. Dear Rob. Dear Rob. Dear Rob. Who knew? This musical rooms open the door! Not until you de crazy yourself! No! There's gotta be something I can get this open with. Well, if it's scary enough for Stephen King, it's scary enough for me. Little pigs, little pigs, let me come in. <laughs> Not by the hair on your tinny chin chin. Then I'll huff, and I'll puff, and I'll blow your house in. This really isn't working. Uh, why don't you just open up the door? Not until you find something positive about the miniseries. It'll clear your head. There is nothing positive about it, and somebody has to pay for it. Somebody has to pay. Pumpkin guacamole? as movie crossovers go! I mean, there's no Avengers, but it was still pretty damn decent! <laughs> okay, I never thought I'd have to use this. Welcome! I'm coming! What have we here? Excuse me, sir. I was wondering if you saw a, uh, black person. Come through here. Why, no good, sir. I was just walking through, reading my James Patterson novel, and listening to Wrecking Ball. Oh, that's a good song. Of course it is. Hey, nostalgia critic. Random white person. I found out something the miniseries did better than the movie. What? What could that possibly be? Jack's character. Huh? For Schnizzle? Jack in the first Shining was just playing, well, Jack. It's just another Nicholson role that could be switched out with any other. But King's version had a very complex, interesting, three-dimensional character that shows step-by-step step what he's going through and why he's going through it. But it's not scary. Just because it's not scary doesn't mean it's not good. I mean, look at Nicholson. That man was born to be scary. Even in the scenes where he's trying to be normal, he's still scary. But in this version, you actually feel sorry for the character and see the natural progression of his tragic story. Hey, that man played a very emotional, very complex, very dramatic... You're right, it's just an Art Nicholson performance. So... Wow. King actually did something better than Kubrick? I mean, the rest of the series is boring, cliched, not the least bit frightening, but 
at the very least, he did explain his main character much better than the Kubrick film did, as Steve Webber did a good job bringing that emotion of a normal guy being tormented to the screen. Despite all its other faults, that part was actually pretty well done. Even if it was just one element, King didn't manage to do something better than Kubrick, one of my heroes. Critic, are, are you okay? No, 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 it's cool. I just need to sit down and think things over for a little bit. What's wrong with them? I don't know. I guess the idea of Stephen King doing something better than Stanley Kubrick was too much for him to take. Huh. Well, it's been a long day. Let's see what else we can find that has pumpkin in it. Oh, well, that's perfect because I found this website called pumpkinporn.com. Ooh. Everything pumpkin related. Oh, pumpkin hot pockets. Yes. Yeah. Pumpkin onion rings. Pumpkin tortilla. Pumpkin meatloaf. Pumpkin. What do you want me to think? Anything as long as it's hard. <laughs>